to borrow or to repay DAI, or to lock or unlock the collateral, the function from inside the contract bet must be called. This function is called when you want to modify a CDP position. So this includes increasing or decreasing the amount of DAI that you borrow, or increasing or decreasing the amount of collateral that you locked. So let's rewrite this function in this video. First, I'll copy all of this function. Inside my code editor, we renamed the back contract as CDP engine. Inside here, I'll paste the code. Okay, here's the function. Before I proceed with rewriting this function, I'm going to first explain what these parameters mean. Basically, what the function will do is modify a CDP. The inputs are named i, u, b, w, dink, and dart. So what do these parameters mean? What these parameters will do is it will modify the CDP position of user u using gem from user b. Here, gem, you can think about it as collateral and creating die for user w. In our code, we're going to rename die as coin. So those are the parameters u, b, and w. The i parameter will be the identifier of the gem, the collateral type. On to the next inputs, dink and dart. Dink is the change in the amount of collateral. And dart is the change in the amount of debt. I'll write the descriptions for the parameters over here. I will be the collateral type, the collateral ID, let's call it. U will be the address that identifies the collateralized debt position. So if we scroll back up, you can see over here that CDP is originally stored in a mapping called yearns. We renamed this as position. And it's a mapping from the collateral ID, bytes32, to an address that is the owner of the collateralized debt position. The U parameter that you saw for the function fraud will be this address that identifies the CDP. Let's say address that maps to CDP. Okay, what's B? Using the gem from user B. So B will be the source of the gem. The address that we're going to either increase or decrease the gem balance of. So let's say source of gem. And W will be the destination to modify the balance of coin. So let's call this destination of coin. And DINK will be the change in amount of collateral. Let's call this delta collateral. And DART will be the change in debt. So let's call this delta debt. Okay, so let's now rename the input and also the function. What the function is going to do is modify a CDP position. So let's rename this to modify CDP. Next, I'm going to rename these inputs. Let's rename the first parameter i. Since this will identify the collateral type, I'll rename it to coal type. Next, let's rename the parameter u. Address that maps to CDP. I'll rename this to CDP. The parameter b, I'll rename it to gem source. The parameter w, I'll rename it to coin destination, coin DST. Dink will be the change in amount of collateral. And notice that here it is int 256. This expresses that the amount of collateral in a CDP can be deducted and also increased. So let's call this delta co. Okay, dart, I'll rename this to delta debt. Okay, that completes the inputs. Next, let's move on. First, it checks that the system is like. This contract, CDP engine, inherits from another contract on the lid called circuit breaker, which handles this logic. The modifier is called not stopped and it checks that live is set to true. So let's replace this live with not stopped modifier and now we can remove this. Next, we load the yearn and the IOK struct. Yearn represents the CDP position and in our code, we rename this as position. And IOK represents some state and some settings about a collateral. And we rename this to collateral. So let's start with yearn. Let's rename this to position. And IOK will rename this to collateral. And I'll do the same for all occurrence of yearn and yearns. Yearns is the mapping from the collateral type to the owner of CDP, and it will store the information about the CDP. I'll start with yearn. I'll rename this to POS for position. Next, I'll do the same for yearns. We rename the yearns mapping to positions. Okay, moving on, I'll rename IOK. IOK, I'll rename this to coal, short for collateral. The mapping IOKS, I'll rename this to collaterals. Okay, moving on, it checks that coal that rate is not equal to zero. We renamed rate in our struct to be rate ACC. So I'll rename this to rate ACC. This is the rate accumulator. Here we're making sure that the rate accumulator is not equal to zero. An authorized account can initiate a new collateral by calling the function init. 
And when it does so, it checks that this rate accumulator is equal to zero, and then it sets it equal to one. Back inside our modify CDP function, here it checks that this rate accumulator is not equal to zero. So to be able to lock collateral, it needs to be a collateral that was initialized. And this is what this check is doing. Next, it's modifying the data that is stored inside position and collateral. And here we have the fields ink, art, and art with a capital A. Let's go back to our definition of the position and collateral to see what we renamed them as. Ink, we renamed it as collateral, the amount of collateral that is locked inside the CDP. Art, we renamed it as debt. This will be the normalized debt that was borrowed by this CDP. And art with a capital A, we renamed it as debt, the total debt that was borrowed using this type of collateral. Okay, so let's go back. So ink, we'll rename this as collateral. And art, we'll rename this as debt. And this will be the same for art with a capital A as well. Okay, so what is this part of the code doing? For the collateral, it's taking the current amount of collateral that is locked inside this CDP and then calling an internal function called add and adding the amount delta col. Basically, it's updating the amount of collateral that is locked inside this position. And the same for debt. Here we have position.debt, call the internal function add, and then update it by delta debt. And the same for call.debt. Take the current amount of call.debt, call an internal function called add, and then add the amount delta debt. Now we have not defined these internal functions, such as underscore add and underscore more. What I'm gonna do next is copy the code from the back contract. And instead of directly copying it into here, I'll create a library called math and then paste it in there. So back inside the back contract, here are the internal math functions. I'm gonna copy all of this. And then back inside my code editor, I'm gonna navigate to a folder called lib, math.sol, open it, and then paste the internal functions. And then I cleaned up the functions that I just copied over. Basically what I did was remove the overflow and underflow checks. Since in Solidity 0.8, this check is no longer needed. Back inside the back contract, we have the math library imported. So next, I'm going to replace all occurrence of these call to the internal function add in mall by using the functions from the math library. And then I'll do the same for the internal function mall. Before we move on, I want to mention here what this delta debt represents. What this delta debt represents is the normalized delta debt. Next, we have the variables d, tab, and tab. What do these two variables represent? Well, we can sort of guess the answer by looking at the next line of code. The next line of code says debt is equal to math.add to the current debt, d tab. Debt is a state variable that is inside the back contract, which I have not defined it yet. This debt represents the global debt. Seeing how this variable called d tab is used, we can guess that this d tab will represent some kind of delta debt, which is being added to the global debt. Inside the back contract, this state variable debt is also called debt. So what I'm going to do is declare a state variable, say uint 256 public. And to be clear that this is a global debt, I'll rename it as system debt, sys underscore debt. Okay, and then going back over here, I'll change this to system debt. And we can also guess what this variable d tab represents. It represents some kind of debt that is being added to the system debt. Notice that some amount of debt is multiplied by the rate accumulator. From these two information, we can conclude that D tab represents the amount of coin that is to be added to the system debt. And tab will represent the total amount of die that is owed to this CDP position. And how do I know this? Well, remember that to get the total amount of die that a CDP position owes to a Dai stablecoin system, we follow this equation. The amount of coin is equal to the rate accumulator, the value of the rate accumulator, times the debt. This coin amount will include both the principal and the interest on principal. Furthermore, since the unit of rate accumulator is ray and debt is WAD, we can conclude that the unit of coin will be in red. This is ray times WAD, or 10 to the 45. So with this in mind, let's take a look at these two variables and then rename them. The first variable d tab is multiplying the rate accumulator by delta debt. So this will give us the delta coin, the amount of coin to add to the system. So let's rename this as delta coin. And then 
Next, we have a variable named tab. The way this variable tab is calculated is multiplying the rate accumulator by the debt of the position. So this will represent the total amount of coin that this CDP position owes to the MakerDAO stablecoin system. Let's rename this to coin debt. Now before we move on, I noticed that here it's multiplying rate accumulator by the debt. Both use the data type UN256, so we don't need to call the function multiply. We can simply multiply in solidity 0.8 since there is no overflow. However, we need to call multiply on this line since delta debt is an int 256. System debt is UN256 and delta coin is int 256. So here we'll call the library function add, which will handle the addition of UN256 with int 256. Okay, moving on. Next, I see a bunch of required, and it's calling an internal function called either or both. Either evaluates whether the first expression is true or the second expression is true. The function both evaluates that both inputs to this function are true. I don't know why it's using a function to do simple Boolean expressions, so I'll remove them. I'll replace either with a or and both with a and. We have a bunch of required. Let's go line by line. The first check is delta debt is either less than or equal to zero. Multiplying the collateral total debt by the rate accumulator is less than or equal to coal dot line. Line we renamed it as max debt, the maximum debt that can be borrowed using this collateral, max debt. And also, we don't need to call a library function for math.mol. Since both debt and rate accumulator are UN256, we can simply multiply these two. And then the other condition is debt. This will be system debt. The global debt is less than or equal to line with a capital L. For collateral, we renamed line as max debt. So we can guess that this line with a capital L will represent the system max debt. I have not declared this state variable yet. So let's go back and declare this. Copy this, and then I'll rename this to system max debt. Okay, and then going back, over here, I'll rename all occurrence of line with a capital L to system max debt. So the second condition says that the current global debt, the system debt, must be less than or equal to the global maximum debt. Okay, let's move on. The next check checks that delta debt is less than or equal to zero and delta coal is greater than or equal to zero. Or coin debt is less than or equal to position collateral times collateral spot. Let's start with the first part of the condition, delta debt less than or equal to zero and delta coal greater than or equal to zero. The first part says that we're either repaying the CDP, hence delta debt will be negative or equal to zero. We're not making any change to the current debt. The second part says we're adding collateral. This will be the case of delta coal greater than zero or we're not adding any collateral. In this case, this will be delta coal equal to zero. This part also says that we're not withdrawing any collateral. If we're withdrawing collateral, this number will be less than zero. So that's the first condition. If this condition does not evaluate to true, then we look at the second condition. The amount of coin debt, the amount of current debt denominated in coin, so this will be the die amount that we owe to the die stablecoin system, must be less than or equal to the amount of collateral that is locked in this CDP, position dot collateral times the spot price of the collateral, coal.spot. Here, this spot price will store the spot price with some safety margins. Okay, let's move on. The next check checks that delta debt is less than or equal to zero, and delta coal is greater than or equal to zero, or wish CDP message sender. We rename this function wish. If we scroll all the way back up, here we have the function called wish, and we renamed it as can modify account takes in two inputs, owner and user. Checks that either the owner is equal to the user or owner has approved the user to modify this CDP. Okay, so let's go back to our function. Let's rename this wish with can modify account. The first part of the condition is the same as the previous one. It, the first part checks that the CDP is less risky than before. And this is done by checking that the amount of debt did not increase and the amount of collateral did not decrease. If this part fails, the next part checks that message sender has the approval to modify this CDP. And we see something similar for the next check as well. The next part checks that either delta coal is less than or equal to zero 
or message sender can modify the account of gen source. This part is pretty straightforward, but how about this part? Delta call less than or equal to zero. Why is it less than or equal to zero? If delta call greater than or equal to represents that we're adding collateral to CDP, shouldn't we check here that delta call is greater than or equal to zero? But instead, what we see here is that delta call is less than or equal to zero. So why is this the case? Well, you'll see down in the code later, this amount is safe when it's the opposite sign. This is the amount that is to be deducted from gem source. So if this delta call was greater than or equal to zero, then this means that we're adding to gem source. If this is less than or equal to zero, it means that we're removing the collateral from gem source. This part of the code will become clearer later. So let's move on. Okay, the next check checks that delta debt is greater than or equal to zero. In this case, we're saying that we're taking on additional debt or message sender was approved to modify the account of coin destination. If delta debt is greater than or equal to zero, we're giving the stable coin to the coin destination. So we don't need their approval. However, if this is less than or equal to zero, then we're deducting from the coin destination. So message sender will need approval from coin destination. Again, this part will be clear as we go further down the code. The next check checks that either position.debt is equal to zero, so the debt is all cleared, or the total amount of debt in the CDP is greater than or equal to dust. We rename dust as min debt, the minimum amount of debt that must be borrowed for a collateral type. Okay, we're almost there. So here it's calling another internal function called sub. I'll replace this with math.sub. The first part of the code updates the balance of gem source for the type collateral type. And the way it updates is it will take the current balance of gem for gem source and then subtracts delta coin. Now, usually you would think that this should be an add. So why is the sign opposite? Here, the sign is opposite because we're moving a collateral from gem to the CDP position. For example, let's say that we're locking collateral into a CDP. Then from this mapping called gem, we need to subtract and to the CDP position, we need to add. And in this case, delta debt will be greater than or equal to zero. With delta debt greater than or equal to zero, we add to the position. Since we're taking the collateral that is stored inside gem to the CDP, on the CDP side, we need to update it by subtracting. Hence, we have a sub here. And likewise, if we're freeing up the collateral from the CDP position to the gem position, we'll be adding and from the CDP position, we're subtracting. So in this case, delta debt will be less than or equal to zero. We add delta debt to the position to decrease the amount of collateral locked in the CDP. And then we'll need to add to this mapping called gem. Since delta debt in this case is less than or equal to zero, to add to gem, we'll need to flip the signs. Hence, again, we use a sub over here. Okay, moving on, we have a mapping called die. We rename this as coin. This will represent the stablecoin balance of coin destination. So what it's doing here is saying to the balance of coin of coin destination, add delta coin. And once all of that is done, we update the information about the CDP by storing the position inside the mapping positions and the information about the collateral inside the mapping collaterals. And that completes the function modify CDP, which was originally called frob. This is probably one of the most important functions to understand inside the back contract. What this function allows users to do is to borrow DAI, lock collateral, unlock collateral, and also to repay DAI.